Uh, it's been about three years since my last talk here, and so I thought this was a good opportunity to give you an update. A lot has been going on. And if you look at just at the first slide of my talk, uh, you might have several questions. Who is Maxwell's demon? <laughs> what barriers did he break? And uh, what's with the photo? Well, I'll start with the first two things, but you have to stay to the end of my talk to find out about the photo. <laughs> so, starting with Maxwell, um, needs no introduction. The best thing I can say about James Clerk Maxwell is that he was Einstein's hero. What else can I say? <laughs> uh, very, lived a very short life. He was only 48 years old when he died. Uh, and towards the end of his life, he started to think about uh, questions of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, and left us a puzzle or a challenge. In some sense, it was his least quantitative work, but uh, something that he left for us to think about. And that became known in the literature as Maxwell's demon. The term was actually coined not by Maxwell himself, but by his friend Lord Kelvin. Apparently, Maxwell did not like it, but uh, nevertheless, it, the, the name stuck. And uh, the demon, uh, can do something that we do not know how to do ourselves. This is an all-knowing creature, a mythical creature, who could sort gas phase particles. In this picture, uh, he is able to see every single gas particle, perhaps billions of them, with that magic flashlight that he's holding, and anticipate where the particle's going to go. And if it's, for example, going to the left, he could open a trap door letting it through, but if it's going to the right, he would keep it closed, thereby rearranging the atoms or molecules in some useful manner, for example, creating a pressure, pressure differential or a temperature differential. So uh, this thought experiment caused a lot of debate in physics and controversy because if you take it very literally, then this would indicate that you could violate the second law of thermodynamics, and people were very troubled by that, so much so that some people felt that if you believe in, in Maxwell's demon, then you must believe in that. Uh, but in fact, um, what I want to convince you about in, in this talk is that Maxwell's demon is real. Uh, he, or it, exists in the lab. And not only does it exist, but Maxwell's demon really holds the key to controlling matter in a very general sense, which has important scientific uh, directions, open up directions in science, but also real life applications, even, I, if I may say, world changing applications, which I will allude to at the very end of my talk. And, and so the question is, um, how does one do this? How does one make this thought experiment come to reality? And I'll just give you a hint. I think people took this picture too literally. And in fact, it's interesting to read Maxwell's own words about the demon. He said, if we conceive of a being whose faculties are so sharpened that he can follow every molecule in its course, such a being whose attributes are essentially as finite as our own would be able to do what is impossible to us. Maxwell apparently was quite religious towards the end of his life, and so he made a point of saying that this is a, a, a finite being because I guess if the Almighty wanted to violate the second law of thermodynamics, who's going to stop it, right? right. But um, he also said, though, that this is impossible to us. And because at the time, in 1871, the idea that you could observe and move particles around in that fashion just seemed impossible. But I would venture to say that doing that on billions of particles, even 140 years later today, to me, still seems impossible. Uh, but if we, if we take his words and, and dissect them, uh, this statement, follow every molecule in, his course, in its course, uh, implies that we uh, have some information about the motion of that particle. And it was realized about, oh, 60 years after Maxwell proposed this thought experiment, that information carries entropy. This first uh, realization is due to Leo Szilard. Szilard proposed this in 1929. He's another one of my heroes, uh, Leo Szilard, a brilliant man, uh, not nearly as well known as Maxwell or Einstein, of course, but uh, he had many great ideas. There's a wonderful biography written about him called Genius in the Shadows by William Lanouette. And in fact, I got to meet Lanouette last summer. We had a delightful conversation and we've kept in touch since then because he's writing a new edition of this book, which will include more on Maxwell's demon and, and on our work. Uh, Szilard realized that the resolution, at least in principle, to the 
paradox of Maxwell's demon is that the demon must collect information. That information carries entropy. So if you account not just for the system itself, but also for the, uh, the information gathered by this creature, then and, and, and account for that entropy increase in the, in the demon, then the second law is safe. And we don't, at least in principle, we don't violate the second law. However, there is still the conceptual, the practical question rather, of how do we do this in reality? Uh, by the way, he's the person on the right, in case you were wondering. Okay. So, um, what, what I want to tell you about today is how Maxwell's demon, I in a very real sense, allows us to break certain barriers, which is something that, as physicists, we like to do. We like to take a certain field, state of the art, and see how we can push that further, or break what, we, what might be perceived as an existing barrier. Uh, the two main things I will talk about are laser cooling and isotope separation. If I have time, I will talk about uh, controlling the nanoscale and, and maybe talk about even other barriers that we might anticipate. So let me start with laser cooling. Uh, it's a very active field, has been uh, pursued for over 30 years and led, has led to a remarkable uh, set of uh, results and experiments on ultra-cold gases and now quantum degenerate gases, bosons and fermions. This is a picture from my laboratory, David Medin took it, it's actually on a calendar now of one of our optics companies that we buy from. Um, but you can see in the center a glowing cloud of lithium-6 atoms at a few hundred microkelvin near the absolute zero. They are just emitting light uh, and uh, just, I think, just for a visual effect, this is impressive. Um, but you might ask, uh, what are the barriers of laser cooling? Uh, on the one hand, you can say it's a method that works perfectly, so perfectly that we can take atoms from room temperature and bring them down to the absolute zero. So you could say, okay, Mark, what else do you want, right? <laughs> Isn't that good enough? But there are certain barriers, and in fact, one of them, the major thing, first, at first sight, is that laser cooling is not a general method. It, in fact, requires, because it uses photons in, in, in a repetitive way, you're using the photon for its momentum, uh, you have to scatter a very large number of photons per atom. And what that requires is a very simple internal structure, essentially a two-level structure, where an atom absorbs a photon, goes up to an excited state, but decays always back to that, down to the same state. Unfortunately, this simple, pro, uh, this simple um, feature exists only for a small set of elements in the periodic table. And depending on how many lasers you are willing to use, it's around 10 to 15 percent. But most elements, most trappers these days trap one particular element, rubidium. In fact, one famous physicist said that, that is, rubidium is God's gift to physicists. And I love rubidium too, but what about hydrogen? Here's, the, you know, here's an atom that one can love even more than rubidium, and it's not amenable to laser cooling. So I would say that that is a barrier. Why can't we find a method that could work on any element in the periodic table? Uh, what about molecules? Could we not control and cool molecules as well as atoms? Um, before, I, um, before I explain how, how we progressed on this problem, I need to introduce one equation. <laughs> And this is about as complicated as it gets, because I, I don't like to swamp you with equations. But you need to remember one number. It's called the phase space density. It is a dimensionless parameter, and it characterizes, uh, some, in some sense, the entropy of the system. The larger the phase space density, the lower the entropy. And it's a product of the density, particles per cubic centimeter, times the de Broglie wavelength cubed. So you make the, the phase space density larger by either increasing the density of the system or reducing the temperature, or both. Uh, temperature alone is not necessarily a good figure of merit because, as you know, you can take a system and adiabatically compress or expand and you change the temperature. You can raise or lower temperature, but you don't change the entropy or the phase space density. Okay, so let's look at laser cooling. And this is today the state of the art just on the atoms that can be laser cooled. So on those 10%, we can ask, well, what can be done? Well, you can characterize it in terms of density. That's the density of ultra-cold atoms that you produce in that glowing picture that I showed you, is approximately 10 to the 9 atoms per cubic centimeter. 
for reasons that I won't go into. Uh, phase space density is 10 to the minus 6. Quantum degenerate gases, you need to get to about an order of unity. So you have to span six orders of magnitude, which people have done. Uh, flux, most important, perhaps the most important number, is uh, about 10 to the 9 atoms per second. And uh, number of photons per atom, which Thompson tells us the efficiency, how, many, how much laser power you need, how many lasers do you need, first of all, is about 10 to the 6 photons per atom. So you can see that it's not too efficient in that regard. Now, when, when the BEC, Bose-Einstein condensation, first was observed in the, in the 90s and, and then developed further, there was a lot of excitement about the so-called atom laser. And people hailed it as the next big thing since the real laser. And in some sense, it's fizzled out. You don't really hear people talking about the atom laser anymore. Why? Because the rate of production, if you ask, this is a laser, what's its output? It turns out it's about 10 to the 4 atoms per second. That would be like I told you, you have a laser, but it puts out 1 femtowatt. Well, it wouldn't be too useful. So there is a barrier. And I would say all these things are barriers that we can ask, can we exceed? Because per, suppose we could increase the flux tremendously, both of an ultra-cold source and, and an atom laser. As I hope to show you, this will actually have real implications. There are, there are cases where you may not care. But in, in other, other cases, it turns out this is a crucial uh, question. So uh, we started down a path about uh, oh, about eight years ago or so, uh, trying to find a different approach. Because if we, if we say we're not going to use laser cooling, we need to have a different starting point. And we have to start from room temperature and somehow bridge the gap and go, ga go, ga go from room temperature down to millikelvin and down to microkelvin in, in, in one method, or perhaps in a, in a set of methods. So we learned something from our colleagues, the chemists. And I also tell my students that go to colloquia because you don't know what you're going to find out. It's not going to be in your field, but it'll be something different. And very often, that is the key thing that you need. And for us, when I first saw this, this really uh, excited me because chemists have known for a long time that you can make a very monoenergetic beam of atoms or molecules. It's called a supersonic beam. So they call it, also call it a molecular beam. Uh, and very simply, it's a source of very high pressure gas a carrier gas that is emitted through a small hole into vacuum. And physici physicists would call that a vacuum leak, but chemists like it. And they don't mind it too much because they actually open this in a pulsed valve, so they actually let out a bunch of atoms or molecules, and uh, they don't over overwhelm their vacuum chamber. But the thing to note is during th this very dense cloud, the atoms or molecules are colliding with each other very frequently. As they expand, they cool into one moving frame. And that frame is moving fast. But if you could go into the moving frame, you'd say that they are very cold, 100 or tens of millikelvin in that cold moving frame. Uh, and in fact, what makes supersonic beams so useful and important is that they are a universal source or platform for ultra-cold atoms or molecules. You can get anything you want, practically, into the beam. And you, you create, especially if you use a pulsed valve like we do, you can create essentially a bullet of gas phase atoms. You have a well-defined t equals zero. That's when you open the valve. And these atoms are moving down the tube at some control velocity. So I think about it like a bullet. And the question is, how can we stop or slow the bullet? Well, we could slam it into a wall, but that wouldn't be too useful. So we thought about this and realized that perhaps we could use magnetic fields. And, and if we imagine that some atoms are paramagnetic, means that they have a magnetic moment, un, an unpaired electron, then uh, we could use a time sequence of pulsed magnetic fields to stop the atoms. And the way this works in, in principle, very simplistically, is that we have a bunch we know the time of flight to the first coil. We turn it on prior to the atoms arriving. And they, in a particular state, the atoms see a magnetic hill. So they climb the hill, slowing down. Well, of course, if we did nothing, they would ride off the hill, speed up again. But we know the timing, so we switch off the field very fast, and we take out that kinetic energy. So it's a decelerator for neutral particles. Uh, one is not enough, but we build a whole series of these, uh, these coils. And the key thing to note is that almost every element in the periodic table is paramagnetic, either, either in its uh, ground state already, or we can easily put it into a paramagnetic state. 
So essentially, this is a almost a universal property. So um, a few years later, we built the device um, and showed that we could stop a supersonic beam of metastable neon. We then showed we could stop a beam of a, uh, molecular oxygen just to show that this could work on atoms or molecules. In parallel to us and completely independently, a group in, in ETH in Zurich, uh, Frederick Merck, uh, stopped atomic hydrogen. And now I just got back a few months ago from a conference in, in, in Zurich where they had uh, maybe 20 groups around the world are building and more want to uh, build these atomic or molecular coil guns because they're very simple and they're robust. And the most recent development, I think, really clinches it. And that's work done by Ed Narevichus and his group. Ed was here a month ago. Some of you were at his talk, and I'll, I'll come back to that. But he, he built something that we had proposed together when he was my postdoc, and he made it work at the Weizmann Institute in his own group. And that's an adiabatic coil gun, which essentially is a three-dimensional trap that catches the atoms in the moving frame and gently brings them to rest. This is, in some sense, the ideal or perfect decelerator because it causes no loss of phase space density. And that is now working. I think that essentially means that this is an ideal method. And I don't really, I think now one can just take this and say we move on now to doing science. Uh, this is a picture, by the way, of the coil gun looking uh, head on, kind of um, down the bore, so to speak. And I like this picture, first of all, because uh, it's illuminated from the back and it proves, as I said to my students, that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, the other reason I like it is I think it bears a remarkable similarity to this. <laughs> but that's just, that's just me. I don't um, But now, the, the, the coil gun approach, this magnetic slowing, is really just, uh, in some sense, coherent manipulation. It does not fit change this, this really important parameter of phase space density. In order to do that, we need some true mechanism of cooling. And how are we going to increase phase space density? Well, imagine a chamber, and I don't throw the particles, but you have gas phase particles bouncing around. We can't see them because we're not Maxwell's demon. Okay? But trust me, they are there. And now we turn on a wall in between. Well, any old wall won't do much, but suppose we turn on a one-way wall. And you can imagine, what would a one-way wall do? It would let particles go one way, but not back. Now, if you could do that, I think you can see that that would lower the entropy of the gas. It would essentially increase the phase space density because they would then occupy a smaller region, so their density would go up, but we wouldn't pay a price in their kinetic energy, so the de Broglie wavelength would stay about the same. And in principle, I could make this a very small volume. Well, we proposed this um, conceptually in 2004. Paper got hung up with referees, got published finally in 2005. But, and then subsequent publications, where we proposed how to cool atoms and how actually to make this one-way wall work in practice with real-life atoms or molecules. We called this process single photon cooling to distinguish it from laser cooling because uh, it uses photons in a fundamentally different way than laser cooling. It uses uh, photons only to activate this one-way wall and not for their momentum. And Without going into great detail, because this is a colloquium, I don't want to uh, get into too much detail of the operation of this one-way wall, but I'll just say that a critical element is to have an irreversible step. And we must have uh, at least three levels, two ground, near ground state levels. Both need to be stable or metastable. I'll color code them one, I'll call the initial state in red and the other in blue. And uh, if you, if you have that um, ability to change the internal state, you could imagine making a potential, conservative potential, that the red atoms do not see. So for them, a wall would be transparent. But for the blue atoms, they see a, a, a barrier, an opaque wall. And so what we do, and, and this is pictures how this cooling method would work in one dimension. Imagine to the left, we start out with a cloud of hot red atoms. And they're bouncing around just in one dimension. Uh, and we, are, we turn on this magical one-way wall off to the side. Well, if it's too far off, the atoms don't reach it because they're not hot enough. But as we start moving it downwards, we start to catch the, the, some of the atoms that are just hot enough that they find this one-way wall near their classical turning point where they've removed most of their kinetic energy. And at that point, they're flipped from red to blue. But the blue state can't come back, so it's stuck but it's stuck at nearly zero kinetic energy. So we've removed, 
We've let the trap do the work on the particle and then removed the kinetic energy and now trapped it ultra cold. And by moving this, this one-way wall inwards, eventually we catch everything. Of course, in 1D it's perfectly efficient and in 3D you might worry, will this still work? So that's why we have to go from a conceptual paper to an experiment. But the experiment works really well. And we showed back in 2008 and in subsequent work that we could take atoms and, and cool them in a very real sense by uh, increasing the phase space density. And we got up to 350 times in phase space density, which is a considerably large number. OK, so uh, now what will Maxwell say? Well, uh, I can only guess, except up to maybe if you had asked me a year or two ago, but I noticed Bruce Hunt, my colleague uh, from the history department, is in the audience. And uh, Bruce brought to my attention a letter that Maxwell wrote to Lord Rayleigh, which when he told me this, I really was quite happy because he said, and I do not see why even intelligence might not be dispensed with and the thing made self-acting allowing all particles going in one direction while stopping all those going the other way. Maxwell essentially realized that, as far as I can interpret, that one needs to have a one-way wall, a self-acting one-way wall, and get rid of this mystical concept of the all-knowing demon. And uh, that's, I mean, that's Maxwell from 1871. So I find that, or 1870, I find that remarkable that he had that intuition. Of course, he could not have known how you would do this in practice. Uh, this is a very generic or general cooling method because you need uh, three or more internal levels, but they could be anything. They could be magnetic, hyperfine, electronic, or in a molecule they could be rotational or, or vibrational. Um, the only case that does not work, ironically, is a two-level atom. But in fact, even the alkali atoms have internal structure. They have hyperfine states, so this is really not any kind of restriction. Uh, so, Maxwell's demon works in the lab because the cooling is not with or via the photon momentum. Instead, we're using the entropy of the photon. And it realizes Maxwell's demon exactly as he predicted. It's a self-acting one-way wall. In fact, we can do even more. We, by analyzing where the entropy is going, we've done this analysis uh, with a, a colleague, uh, Gonzalo Muga, in Spain, where we actually analyzed the entropy of the emitted photon. Because remember, when an atom goes through this one-way wall, it takes a photon from a laser beam, which is a source of nearly zero entropy photons, and scatters it into some random direction, whereby the entropy of the photon has increased. Well, we can calculate that, and lo and behold, that explains the entropy decrease of our gas. So there's no mystery here. Uh, we understand where's the sink, where's the source and where's the sink of entropy, and we understand exactly how it works and why it works. So maybe in some sense have taken out the mystery. Uh, Maxwell's demon is not this mythical creature. It's just a laser beam. Uh, but um, nevertheless, if we put these things together, I would claim that we have a, a two-step solution which is quite general. Uh, the atomic molecular coil gun and single photon cooling, and this was published in an invited review article in 2009, uh, which I talked about three years ago. Uh, since then, I published a uh, kind of more popular version, which you can download from the group's website. Uh, everything about the article I, I wrote, except for the title, they rewrote that, as you can guess, because demons attracts readership. But I can now address a question, because, because it's clear that this breaks a certain barrier, the barrier of the generality of laser cooling. But what about the barrier of numbers? Because, OK, if, if we, if we want to compare um, our methods with, directly with laser cooling, it is a fair question to ask, how would it compare on those atoms that can be laser cooled, like the alkali atoms? Now, three years ago, I couldn't answer that. I didn't have an optimum way of putting this together. Today, I can, and I make a prediction. So uh, we, ha uh, we, we have now, and we are about to actually publish this uh, concept paper, and now we'll work on the experiment. But here's the numbers that we predict, based on everything we know so far. We, we know we can uh, use the adiabatic coil gun to optimally bring a beam to a ter any terminal velocity that we desire. It could be 100 meters per second. It could be rest. In some cases, we may want ultra-cold atoms at rest. Then we figured out a way to compress them with a one-way wall, not in real space, but in velocity space. And I won't go through the details, but 
um, the paper will come out soon, and it'll show how we can then compress them independently in the three dimensions of x, y, and z in velocity space, reaching the same temperatures as you would get with laser cooling. Well, this is what we predict in terms of density, higher density, because we only have to do optical pumping. We only have to um, scatter a few photons per atom. Phase space density, we think about two orders of magnitude higher. This perhaps is the most significant number. We think it can beat laser cooling by about four orders of magnitude. And photons uh, per atom, around 30. And so when I put these numbers together, I would say, this is my, my conclusion, is that I suggest that these methods uh, are a replacement for laser cooling because uh, they are much more general. And even for the cases of, of atoms that can be laser cooled, we predict much better performance. Now we have to do this. And we are, in the next year or two, I hope we can actually show that. But independently, the methods clearly work. So the generality is there. We are working in my group to uh, apply these methods towards uh, trapping and cooling of atomic hydrogen isotopes, hydrogen, uh, deuterium, and tritium. Uh, tritium is the most interesting uh, for reasons of beta decay. Uh, I don't think we will have enough atoms to be able to ever trap enough atoms to actually do any kind of endpoint measurement. But there are plenty of other measurements one can do on tritium, starting from uh, a, a precision measurement of the 1s, 2s uh, transition, which uh, gives you information about the triton charge radius, uh, the um, uh, f uh, correlation in beta decay, and I'm working with uh, some people at the Hebrew University on how that might improve limits uh, testing of a standard model. So there are many interesting things that you can do with tritium, and uh, our methods are perfectly suited to all these cases. Uh, in the realm of chemistry, uh, there was a talk last month, as I mentioned, by Ed Narevichis from Weizmann, and he's done beautiful experiments where he's taken the methods that we started together, and he's now done, a really, I think, a landmark experiment where he's take, taken two supersonic beams, one paramagnetic and the other not, and by switching a large magnetic field, he merges them and causes them to now co-propagate, and he sees chemical reactions at temperatures down to 10 millikelvin and sees quantum oscillations in the reaction rate. This is really, in some sense, with these merged supersonic beam, he will, he will be able to study canonical, very simple chemical reactions that, that, um, that people have talked about, but so far have, are not amenable to laser cooling. For example, um, H2 plus F for example, or we could think of many other canonical simple chemical reactions. Ed will be able to do that. But Ed is also working on actual cooling of molecules using our methods. Uh, now you might ask, well, if I give you uh, much better performance, if I break the barriers of numbers, where could that be important? And uh, I offer three, three areas where numbers are important. One is at atomic interferometry where you can measure very small phase shifts. This is used for geodesy, for uh, testing fundamental physics, such as testing of the weak equivalence principle, uh, and searching for um, you know, other effects, atomic clocks. Uh, if, if you're making a lattice atomic clock, then again, your, your signal to noise will depend on square root of number. And uh, so just uh, for uh, metrology purposes, and even tests of fundamental physics, such as searches for time, possible time variation of the fundamental constants. Uh, where we have been interested in this is uh, to really boost the flux up for the purposes of atom lithography towards controlling the nanoscale, which I'll come back to time permitting at the end of my talk. But now, in the time that remains, I want to switch gears and talk about the second barrier. It's completely different. but. It also involves atoms, and it is the barrier of isotope separation. Isotopes are, as you all know, are atoms with the same uh, properties but different number of neutrons, and atoms of a particular uh, element may have a n number of stable isotopes, and they can have radioisotopes that are short-lived. Uh, the Pro pro the process of isotope separation dates back to about 1930, a uh, machine that was invented by Ernest Lawrence called the Calutron, uh, which uh, achieved isotope separation that was built specifically for the Manhattan Project to separate uranium. Uh, this is a photo of Y12 Calutron at Oak Ridge. Um, 
there's not a person there for scale, but you can imagine this is huge. Uh, they actually had to commission, borrow, I think, all the silver in Fort Knox for the, for the wire and, uh, that, that were used in, in, in this, uh, for these magnets. In fact, um, this is a modern calutron. Modern means circa 1950, because that's about as modern as it gets, uh, which is essentially, it's an electromagnetic separator. It's based on ionization. You make a stream of neutral atoms, and you ionize them by bombarding them with electrons, and then you separate them in a curved path by their charge to mass ratio. So it's kind of a, like a big spectrometer. And um, now, we are in 2013. We are f find ourselves in an unusual situation that a particular technology has become obsolete before there is a replacement. That usually doesn't happen, but that's what we're facing. Uh, today, uh, there is only one Calutron program in operation, and that's in Russia. Uh, I'm told that, that the Calutron is heavily subsidized. It, it, it's so inefficient and so expensive to run, so this could turn off any day. Uh, and it supplies essentially all, uh, almost all elements, most elements in the periodic table are produced today with the Calutron. In fact, that leads me to the next slide, which is that these are, these three methods are the main modes of production of, of enriched isotopes. Uh, the one that I started historically, the, the electromagnetic approach, so-called calutron, which works on most elements in the periodic table. The centrifuge, which is certainly most famous or infamous because people know what it's used for, which is for uranium separation. Uh, it's used for a few other elements, but they have, to be a, they have to be in gas phase, and either they're in gas phase already or you can find some molecular compound like uranium hexafluoride or molybdenum hexafluoride that uh, could be put into a centrifuge. And finally, laser separation has a long history, so you could say, well, th this is n nothing new, but laser separation uh, by, go, goes by the acronym AVLIS, Atomic Vapor, uh, 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 laser isotope separation, I think it stands for, um, is a method that was uh, proposed and then implemented in the 1990s, and it is based on the fact that uh, different isotopes uh, have, their, their transition frequencies are slightly shifted from one another, that is so-called isotope shift, and uh, it was realized that you could use lasers to ionize selectively a particular isotope and then extract it. And uh, but the, the difficulty of doing that is that you have to overcome the tendency of the atom to fall back to its ground state. So you have, to, you have to saturate the first transition, and then you have to excite it to the continuum where it has a very small cross-section. And so the upshot is that you need uh, very high power lasers, multi-kilowatt lasers. And it was pushing the state of the art. These are, uh, for people in the audience who know what this is, uh, copper vapor pumped uh, dye lasers amplified dye lasers. And I see Mike Downer smiling because I remember seeing broken copper vapor lasers. And anyone who's had copper vapor lasers know that they do not run all the time. <laughs> it's kind of an understatement. So the Avlis program actually shut down in the 90s. Although they were able to demonstrate that it works, the scale was so big that, first of all, even for uranium separation, it just wasn't it wasn't viable. And it was certainly not viable for small scale isotopes that are needed for medicine. Uh, in fact, uh, th this, um, this looming crisis led to a, uh, a study by the Nuclear Science Advisory Committee to the Department of Energy. And uh, in that study, they, it's a very uh, extensive document. In fact, it's publicly available, so you can download it and read it yourself from 2008. Uh, Isotopes for the Nation's Future uh, alerts to the fact that we are... Uh, relying on stockpiles of, of, um, of isotopes that were, um, that were, uh, that were uh, produced in, uh, in the U.S. calutrons, and all other isotopes are now um, imported from Russia. I would claim that isotopes really are a great natural resource, an untapped natural resource to, to a large extent. Um, and, and you can divide it into basic science, medicine, and energy. So to, I mean, these are just uh, really a, a small samples, examples of, of where they could be useful. Uh, two examples are calcium-48 and neodymium-150. 
Uh, both elements, both isotopes, are um, neutron rich and believed to undergo a process of neutrinoless double beta decay uh, if the uh, neutrino is its own antiparticle, a so called Majorana particle. If that happens, if that's true, then they will see this decay mode, and there are numerous groups around the world that are working hard to try and observe this effect, and if they can see that, then they claim they may be able to determine the rest mass of the neutrino. So, but, but the catch is that they need to have enriched isotopes. These are stable isotopes, uh, and the natural abundance of calcium-48 is only 0.2 percent. The natural abundance of uh, neodymium-150 is about 5 percent, and so you need to first en enrich the stable isotope to a, you know, above 90, 95 percent, and then search for this decay mode. Uh, the uses in medicine are, are quite profound and important. Uh, calcium-48 is a stable isotope. It's used as a tracer. Uh, it, it's uh, just for bone development in children, osteoporosis. Uh, the other isotopes, which are all, these are all stable isotopes, uh, are the precursors for radioisotopes. For, so, for example, nickel-64 is converted in a medical cyclotron to copper-64, which is a very promising uh, isotope for PET scans and for tumor therapy. Uh, someone asked me, what, well, what pets do you, can you use it on? Dogs, cats? No. <laughs> uh, um, Ytterbium-176 can be converted in, by neutron capture in a reactor to, uh, and it decays to lutetium-177, which is a, a very, very promising uh, uh, tr uh, radioisotope for treatment of soft tumors. Uh, molybdenum-100 is a potential pathway towards uh, producing technetium-99M, which is used in uh, almost 85 percent of all nuclear medicine for imaging is technetium-99M. And so we can go on and on. Uh, energy, uh, interesting cases, uh, lithium-7, I'll come back to that. Uh, gadolinium-157 is a burnable poison in a, in a, in a reactor fuel rod, could strong absorb of neutrons. If you could take pure gadolinium-157 or 155, you could increase efficiency of a, of a reactor. Uh, mercury, if you just look up, everyone should look up, what do you see? Fluorescent light bulbs, right? Uh, 60% of all lighting in the world is fluorescent. 25% of all electricity is on lighting. So you do the math. It's a lot, of, a lot of electricity goes into fluorescent lighting. What we predict, and actually has been known for a while, that it, if you could tailor the isotopic abundance of the mercury in each bulb, you could get a lot more light out. And we, I can't tell you the numbers yet, but, we are, but I can tell you it's a pretty big factor. And uh, and there are seven naturally occurring isotopes. That's what nature gives us. Now, why is, this, why is this happening? Well, that's not because so much of the nuclear properties, but just because, um, because you have a dense gas in a discharge. You have an arg argon and mercury in an argon atmosphere, and you have a discharge, and there's certain opacity. And the UV photons, the 254 nanometer photons, have to make their way out towards the fluorescent coating where they then fluoresce. But the problem is, is, is that because of the high opacity, they get lost, and they do a random walk, and eventually a mercury atom falls into a non-radiating state, and, is, and the excitation is gone, leading to a loss of efficiency. What if we could make that photon get out much more readily, and uh, thereby increase the efficiency of fluorescent light bulbs? And I know uh, people um, might say, well, fluorescents are on the way out anyway, because we're all going to have solid-state lighting, and that's true eventually, but most people Experts have told me that it's probably going to be 20 years, and it might be hard to retrofit every office building in the world, which are already fit for fluorescence. So these are just, I would say, a small sampling. But isotopes today are, in many cases, uh, too expensive uh, for, for research and too expensive for even for medicine. I mean, to give you a scale, it's, it's, it is really the most expensive commodity on Earth, where one... Uh, um, let's say one ounce of calcium-48 is $3 million. So that's about 2,000 times the price of gold. That I would say, venture that is probably the most expensive commodity on Earth. And so when my colleagues, uh, high-energy colleagues, say, oh, we need about five kilograms of, of calcium-48 <laughs> for to do a competitive neutrinoless double beta kick experiment, I say, well, let's say that, well, you can do the math yourself, but five kilograms at, at uh, $3 million per, per ounce, I don't, think, I don't think they could afford it. But, so we have to bring the price down of everything. And, and likewise, new, new therapies will be made available 
uh, if, if, the, if these, uh, some of these radioisotopes would not be as expensive. So uh, we proposed that Maxwell's demon could be used for isotope separation. And we called the process magnetically activated and guided isotope separation, or MAGIS for short. Uh, and I claim that this is a replacement for the calutron. Now, when I talk about isotope separation, the question of proliferation naturally comes up. And, and I don't uh, want to avoid a discussion about it. In fact, I encouraged it. So the, you remember, some of you may remember that about a year ago, Charles Ferguson was here. He's the president of the Federation of American Scientists. And when he was here, I showed him what we're doing. And he said, would you be willing to have an online debate about this? And I said, sure. And uh, my debate opponent is Francis Slakey, who's Associate Director for Public Affairs for the American Physical Society. Uh, Francis Slakey is, is uh, you know, a reputable person, but he's very outspoken against uh, laser enrichment of uranium. And so we held this debate. We had certain debate rules where we each got an opening statement, and then we got a chance for a rebuttal. And I made my points and, uh, in the opening statement and then had a rebuttal. Slakey had an opening statement but chose not to submit a rebuttal. So in the world of debates, it means I won. <laughs> but, but, but no, actually, more seriously, uh, Slake and I have talked about it, and privately he agrees with me. So it's actually an unusual situation where you enter into a debate with someone, you usually expect them to dig in. But I think he was convinced by my arguments, and he, he, we've talked about actually writing a joint article together about the wonders and, and great things about isotopes. So I may have really converted him. Uh, um, what are the fig figures of merit of isotope separation really come down to three things. One is the isotopic purity, the scalability to required quantities, which of course vary from one isotope to another, and the overall efficiency. Uh, the, the method, the MAGIS method, is extremely efficient in the way it uses photons, first of all. Uh, we start with a stream of atoms coming from a, a source. This is just like the calutron. But we can then, using a few photons per atom, we can put them into a magnetic state that is reflected or repelled by a large magnetic field. This is a process to the experts in the audience is called optical pumping. But it can be done at the price of a few photons per atom. With the right polarization, you can, you can achieve this optical pumping. And now we subdivide the, the, uh, the outgoing flux into many uh, channels, each channel then has a, um, an, a small angular divergence, but in the longitudinal direction, it still has its own Maxwellian velocity distribution. That doesn't bother us. And we assemble permanent magnets. These are just rare earth magnets that you can buy, um, uh, uh, samarium cobalt magnets that are uh, very powerful, provide surface fields of over one Tesla. And we put them in a particular configuration, which maximizes the field. And all we do is we have no line of sight here, so our collector cannot see the source. And that means that an atom coming, streaming downstream, coming from the source, if it, uh, assuming it sticks, which we can assume based on the vapor pressure of most of the elements, uh, it, there's no way it can make it to the end if there's no line of sight. But the atom that we tag in that particular state can reflect, it's in the right state to be actually reflect or repelled from this large magnetic field, and it makes it through, and we can collect it. So this is actually a really simple idea. And now I come to explain the photo, which I found. Um, and people ask me, well, is this some connection with Latvia? Because there was something in the title that it was taken in Latvia. No, what I liked about the picture is that, and this again uh, was thanks to Bruce Hunt, who point, pointed this out to me, was the historic pointsman of the railroad tracks, which is, I guess, uh, gone today. I don't know if it exists. Probably now it's a computer. Right? Maybe that's a good thing. Uh, it's a good thing because if you read the subtitle, it says, when Pointsman has a cup of tea. Maybe that's not such a, such a good idea, right? <laughs> the computer doesn't go out and have a cup of tea. You might wonder what ha what's going to happen in the, in the meantime. But the, this Pointsman was responsible for switching the tracks and for making a particular train go in a different direction. And that is what we are doing with our photons. Our photons are the, like the historic Pointsman, they are switching the tracks for the desired isotope. So coming from a concept, uh, we really started working hard on this problem. And um, Bruce Klapov, a senior scientist in my group, and Tom Azur, now a senior grad student, 
uh, I've been working on the experiment, we predicted that uh, we could do this with highly depleted lithium. So lithium uh, comes in naturally in two isotopes. Uh, lithium-7 is 92.5% uh, abundant, and then lithium-6 is the rest. Uh, lithium is, has many uses, um, lithium batteries, uh, lithium for medicine, but in the case of uh, lithium isotopes, uh, it turns out today lithium-7 is needed, pure lithium-7 is needed in reactor water cooling. It is used in the form of lithium hydroxide. It is used as a base that neutralizes the boric acid in the water. And you need, so you need, but you can't have lithium-6 present because when neutrons bombard lithium-6, they convert it partially into tritium, and then the tritium will exchange with the hydrogen, and you get tritiated water, which is an environmental mess. And so there are very strict regulations. Actually, the, the federal, uh, the, the nuclear um, uh, uh, regulatory commission uh, requires a purity of greater than 99.95 percent, is the, as far as I know, is the current uh, requirement. And if they test the water and find even uh, le uh, uh, more lithium-6 present, they will shut down the reactor. Uh, ironically, the method for lithium enrichment uh, uses, uh, in, that was developed in this country uh, actually is a chemical method, which is unusual because most isotopes cannot be separated chemically, but because of its light ma small mass, lithium can be, and it, using uh, mercury to form an amalgam, they, they pass uh, lithium through this column, and it's called the column exchange method, and there's a preferential uh, amalgamation of the lithium-6 with the mercury, and by passing it successively, you can purify out the lithium-6. But that method led to huge uh, contamination of mercury at Oak Ridge. It's now forbidden everywhere in the world, except right now in China and Russia. But I, but I think in a few years, they will come to their senses and stop that too. And then there will be no source of, of highly depleted lithium. So there is actually quite an urgent need. It, you could say it's almost a national priority or urgency to, to produce this highly depleted lithium. What I can tell you today is that the experiment is working. Uh, and we can say that we produce uh, lithium at, at a lower, um, a lower bound is 99.97%. We think it's higher, but we've reached the signal to noise limit of our experiment so far. The scalability and efficiency are as predicted. I can show you the mass spectrum, and that's all I'm going to show you today, but we are going to submit this in about a week for publication. Uh, this shows you, this is probably the most important slide to, to see, it shows uh, a, a, um, spe a spectrum. Uh, in this case, there are only two masses that are relevant, mass 6 and mass 7. Mass 6 is lithium-6, 7 is lithium-7. We actually started the experiment with enriched lithium-6. We buy particularly lithium-6, which, which has about 95% lithium-6 and 5% lithium-7, in order to improve our signal-to-noise ratio, because it gives us a bigger dynamic range. And you can see that without the laser present, without our pointsman at, uh, going, then that's the blue curve. And you can see that we, and th this, by the way, is a semi-log plot, so th this is uh, each time is a factor of 10 here. And so you can see we are dominated by lithium-6, and then we have a peak at lithium-7. Now we turn on the pointsman that's going to redirect the train tracks, and you see it has no effect on the lithium-7, but it completely depletes the lithium-6. Lithium-6 is now pumped into a state that is even attracted to the magnetic field. So when it comes in, not only is it going to crash into that wall, it's pulled into the wall faster, and it sticks, and it's gone, and we don't see any any lithium-6 present. So this is in a very small, compact machine. In one stage of enrichment, we get this factor. All right, so uh, coming, winding down my talk, um, I'm just going to mention, because really th these would take maybe another hour to, to do it any justice, but I, I did want to indicate some other things going on in the group and in, in the same spirit of, of breaking barriers. And one of them that really, I think, in the next year or two <coughs> will uh, lead to interesting results <coughs> is that we are applying the same type of magnetic control that we learned so, uh, so far in stopping supersonic beams. We now know how to build what we think is the perfect magnetic lens. That is a, a pulsed electromagnetic lens that can take a beam, a supersonic beam of atoms, and remember this beam now not only is it uh, 
it, it is, starts out very cold, but we, we've learned how to compress it in velocity. So now we have the brightest source, almost laser-like source of atoms, and now we can build the optics to manipulate that, that source of atoms and do something really interesting with it. And what we think is really interesting is to be able to image the atoms down to the nanoscale. And the way this will work is that we have a pulsed magnetic lens. This magnetic lens uses the same large currents that we used for stopping atoms, but now in a configuration where they have a perfect radial linear gradient. So it acts like a perfect lens uh, and will achieve a focal length of around one centimeter. If for an atom moving at 500 meters per second, will come to a focus in about a centimeter. And so now, because we can achieve short focal lengths, we can do true, uh, true imaging. We can put a, a, a transmission mask at the image plane, at the object plane, and then make a image plane where we will image, let's say, 10, 20, 30x down. So that means we can start with a transmission mask that is produced by standard lithography at the 100 nanometer scale and go down 30x to 3 nanometers. The diffraction limit for us uh, can be as the de Broglie wavelength is below 1 nanometer. There's no fundamental reason why we can't even get down to one nanometer scale. But conservatively, uh, from the simulations we've done so far, it looks like easily sub 10 nanometers, I would say more like five nanometers. And that's a really interesting scale. It's a scale of quantum dots, which is something that today, uh, although chemists can synthesize them very well in solution, they can't be grown epitaxially. They can't be in a very controlled way. They use a method called self-assembly, which leads to huge fluctuations in size of one quantum dot to another. So if you say, can you make an array of quantum dots that are all the same, the answer today is no. Of course, ultimately, we will be limited by Poissonian fluctuations, but that's not so bad. If we have a quantum dot that has 10 to the 4 atoms, that means we will have about 1% fluctuation from dot to dot. Today, the state of the art is about 1,000%. So again, in the spirit of breaking barriers, uh, if we can make an array that's nearly uniform, then that opens up a lot of possibilities in terms of uh, photonics, making uh, quantum dot lasers, that they're all going to be the same. They will all emit at the same wavelength. Uh, even uh, making photon states, Fox states of photons, where you could really control the photon number. So I think um, the idea of, of, of imaging down and use, doing lithography on that scale is really compelling. There's also another twist to this. Uh, and, and the paper should, by the way, should be posted on, hopefully on the archive soon, uh, is that we think we can build a new kind of microscope with this kind of lithography using metastable atoms. This microscope would work by sending metastable helium, for example, and when it hits a surface, it undergoes a process called penionization, where it releases its electron, about 20 electron volts above its ground state, and that electron in about half of the time is emitted by the surface. Well, p chemists have known for a long time that you could actually analyze the electron, uh, the electron energies. If you look at the spectrum of the electrons, that tells you what is the chemical composition on the surface. So it's a, it's a chemically sensitive probe, and that's been known for a long time. But what was lacking was spatial resolution. And we think we can combine nanometer scale resolution with uh, chemical sensitivity. So this is a chemically sensitive microscope. We think that we can... Um, uh, potentially uh, fabricate the objects on that scale. Uh, this ultimately has to be, this has to be something that will be integrated with materials growth. And so I'm working with a material scientist, Seth Bank, over in electrical engineering, and together we hope to really, first of all, make this work in the lab downstairs, but then ultimately incorporate this into, uh, into real, really building materials. So, so actually we are getting quite serious about doing this. Uh, and I call, I've called this before atomoscience, and I, I'm hoping that in the next year or two, there will be real meat on that bone, and not, not just a, con a, a, a simple concept, but something that actually will work. Um, another kind of barrier is a statistical mechanics barrier, and we've been working on, on Brownian motion at short times. This is a project that started my group and EL's group, and now we're continuing this. We uh, have observed and, con and continuing to study this short time um, instantaneous velocity of Brownian motion. And now what I'm particularly interested in is, is the non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, what happens when we take a system like that and, and push it very far from equilibrium. How does it, how does it return to equilibrium? And uh, 
Phil Marson, I don't know if he's in the audience, but I hope, yes, uh, hope to work with him and his group on, on understanding that better. Uh, quantum mechanics barrier, uh, we are working in another experiment to make uh, atomic Fock states. These are uh, little, uh, little states of atoms. I call them little Fockers. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a, a, few, a, few, uh, a few atoms, uh, an atom on demand, basically where you push a button and you get an atom in the ground state of a microtrap. If we can do that, and we are close, in fact, to doing that, then that will be the building block for studying quantum entanglement, for generally quantum simulation, and in a long-term sense for quantum computing. So there are all these barriers, and, and, and it's, it's really fun and exciting to, to be working on this. So I'd just like to end by thanking um, all the talented and motivated people in my group, and of course, many past members of, of my group as well, but uh, this is the current group, and they are, uh, this is the overall picture, but uh, roughly grouped according to the projects that they were working on, postdoc Rodrigo Castillo-Gaza and graduate students Jamie Gardner and Sagi Zisman uh, on the Brownian motion experiment, Simon Hafetz, Akash Simha, and Kevin Mellon, uh, the Lithium-6 experiment, uh, Fox State generation, David Medine and Jen Young Mo, and on our isotope project, uh, Bruce Klapoff, a senior scientist in the group, and Tom Mazur, a senior graduate student, and the three undergraduates who are working in the lab, Daniel Remy Zlatik, Camilo Perez, and Theron Morrison. And I'd just like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>